last class we started our discussion of the respiratory system. We did discuss a little about the structure of the upper respiratory tract. And if you remember what we've seen last class, we've seen the nostril, which is the opening of the nose. We've seen the depression in the nasal mucosa. This was my nasal vestibule. And as you pass through the nose, which is formed of a bony part, formed of the nasal bones and the cartilage part, formed by the hiding cartilage, we did get into a cavity, and this is what we've called the nasal cavity. If you remember, nasal cavity is not smooth on the inside. It has those bony eminences protruding from the side, and those, pro those bony eminences covered by mucous membranes, those are my nasal, uh, nasal concave. And in between, we did have those tracts. This is where the air is going to be flowing. We call those are my nasal meatuses. Posterior to the nasal cavity, we've got the part of the pharynx located behind the nasal cavity. We call this is my nasopharynx. And if you remember, we've seen the lymphoid tissue located in the nasal pharynx. This is my pharyngeal tonsil. And we've seen an opening of the eustachian tube or the pharyngeal tympanic tube, which equalizes the pressure on both sides of the tympanic membrane for the tympanic membrane to be able to move freely for responding to the sounds. For you to be able to hear. And down below my nasopharynx, we've got the oropharynx, which is a part of the pharynx located behind or posterior to the oral cavity. This part on here. We also have seen the oral cavity, and if you remember, the oral cavity has a roof formed of the heart palate which is, if you remember, was formed of three or four different bones, the processes, the palatine processes of my maxillary bones, two of them, and the palatine bones, which are forming the posterior one-third of the heart palate. Posterior to the heart palate, we've seen the muscles covered by mucous membranes. Those are forming my soft palate. On the sides of the oropharynx, we've got another cluster of lymphoid tissues. This is another tonsil on here. This is my palatine tonsil. This was in the roof and the sides of my oral cavity and oropharynx. The floor is formed by the tongue, which is attached to, down to multiple bones, and the major one of them was the hyoid bone. Also, we've seen a cluster of lymphoid tissues that are going to be located in the tongue. We call this is my lingual tonsil. Lingual, lingual means, lingual means tongue. So like language, language, you're speaking a tongue, different tongue, different languages. Lingual, lingual means related to the tongue. So we've got a cluster of lymphoid tissue is going to be located in the tongue. So we call this as my lingual tonsil, lingual tonsil. Bending down from the soft palate in the midline, 
we call this as my user. If we travel down from the oral cavity and oral pharynx, remember we're gonna pass down into another part of the pharynx, which is my laryngopharynx. And the laryngopharynx is located behind the larynx, which is my voice box. Remember, we've seen multiple cartilages that will share in the formation of the larynx. We've got one located above the vocal cords, above the larynx. This is my epiglottis. Anteriorly, we've got the thyroid cartilage and cricoid cartilage in the back. If you remember, we've seen inside the larynx, we've, uh, we've seen those vestibular folds with the vocal cords, true vocal cords and false vocal cords. If you remember, true vocal cords, those are the connective tissue strings that we've got to, that we move to produce the sound. And on the side, we've got those muscular folds that will be determining the tension of the true vocal cords. Those are my false vocal cords or my vocal or my vestibular folds. So we've got two folds on here. We've got vestibular folds. Those are the false vocal cords, which are the muscles on the side on here. And we've got the true vocal cords. Those are the connective tissue strings that will be vibrating to produce the sound. Down below the larynx is the voice box where you keep your vocal cords. You've got a tube through which the air is going to be traveling to reach your lungs. We call this tube that is kept open by the presence of the coastal cartilage by, by the uh, tracheal cartilages. So this will be my trachea. So the trachea here is the tube through which the air is going to be traveling down from my larynx to reach my lower airways. Looking here at a superior view of the larynx, we've seen here, this is the base of the tongue. Posterior to it, you've got a cartilage that will kink to close the larynx and the lower airways. This is my epiglottis. Down within the larynx, we can see two, the true vocal cords. And on the sides, again, those are my false vocal cords or my vestibular folds. You can see on the inside, those rings, those are the cartilage rings that are keeping the trachea patent, keeping the trachea open. Moving on today to discuss the rest respiratory system, we divide the respiratory system into two main zones. We've got the conducting zone, and the conducting zone is acting as a conduit for the air down. It doesn't allow any gas exchange to take place, and this includes the trachea until you reach the, to the terminal bronchioles. So all this doesn't allow any gas exchange to take place. The bronchi, their divisions, until you reach the terminal bronchioles, all those are not gonna be allowing any gas exchange to take place. We can call them the conducting zone. Conducting zone. Respiratory zone, on the other hand, those will allow gas exchange. They are formed of microscopic structures. This includes the respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, 
and the alveoli. So again, again, what are the different parts? A very common question that you're gonna see is which of the following does not allow or allows uh, gas exchange? Which of the following allows gas exchange? So please answer this as your number one question, which of the following allows gas exchange? This is gonna be your number one question for today. And the choices are respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, alveoli, and the all of the above. What do you think? Is this, which one of the following allows gas exchange to take place? All of the above, all of the above is your good answer, all of the above. So the most common wrong answer that I usually see is gonna be alveoli. All right, the most common wrong answer here is alveoli. All right, the good answer is gonna be all of the above. All of them, all of the three are gonna be part of my respiratory zone. So all of the three are allowing gas exchange to take place. Associated with the conducting and respiratory zones, we've got the respiratory muscles, and this includes the diaphragm, and the intercostal muscles along with the abdominal muscles and all those gonna be promoting the ventilation to take place. All of this gonna allow ventilation to take place. According to whether it's a slow breathing, whether it's a deep inspiration, whether it's a deep expiration. So according to what you're doing, you're gonna be regulating the number of muscles that will become activated. Starting first with the conducting zone, first we've got the trachea. So we're done with the larynx and the upper respiratory tract. Below it, we've got the trachea, which is kept patent by the presence of the, of the cartilage rings. The trachea will split into two main branches, my right and left bronchi. And each main bronchus, this is what we call the main bronchi, main bronchus, each of the main bronchi gonna be dividing into smaller bronchi. Those are called the lower bronchi. Each one is gonna be directing the air towards a lobe of the lungs. That's why we call it lower bronchi. If you can see on here, on the right side, we've got three lower bronchi. Compared to on the left side, we've got only two lower bronchi. So what this means for me, this means that the right lung has three lobes and the left lung has only two lobes. So if we're again looking at the first division of the main bronchi. 
we're going to have the Luber bronchi and the Luber bronchi are going to be two on the left side and three on the right side. Again, why? Because simply your le right lung has three lobes compared to the left lung has only two lobes. Each lobar bronchi, each lobar bronchus gonna be splitting into smaller bronchi. Those are the segmental bronchi. So we're going to be splitting each lobe into segments and each segment is going to be supplied by air through the segmental bronchi. So again, again, first three types of bronchi that we see. First, I have my main bronchi. We have right main bronchus, left main bronchus. Each main bronchus gonna split into lower bronchi again. On the right side, we've got three lobes. So we've got three lower bronchi. And on the left side, we've got only two lower bronchi. Each lower bronchus gonna split into smaller bronchi. Those are called my segmental bronchi. Each one gonna be supplying the air to a segment within the lobe. Those will keep branching. We have a total of 23 orders of division. 23 orders of division that will be taken place, 23 orders of branching that will be taken place on here until you reach the terminal bronchioles, which are very small and will conduct the air down to my respiratory zone, which includes my respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveoli. So looking here at this diagram, this is a five stars diagram showing the different orders of division in my respiratory tract. We started first by the trachea. The trachea splits into a right main bronchus and a left main bronchus. Each main bronchus is each main bronchus gonna split into smaller bronchi, those are called my lower bronchi. And we've got three lower bronchi on the right and we've got two on the left. Each lower bronchus gonna be given rise to smaller branches, those are called the segmental bronchi segments. I'm supplying segments of the pulmonary lobes. Other names that we're going to be given to those bronchi, we call the main bronchus also a primary bronchus. So you need to know the two terms that we use to describe the bronchi on here. So again, again, main bronchus is also called primary bronchus. Lower bronchus is gonna be also called secondary bronchus. And segmental bronchus is gonna be also called tertiary bronchus. So again, again, all this is gonna be part of my conducting zone. Do I have any gas exchange within my conducting zone? Can you remind me, please? Do you allow any gas exchange to take place in the conducting zone? 
no gas exchange exactly no gas exchange will be taking place throughout the length of the conducting zone trachea and again how many orders of branching do we, do we get here until for us to reach the respiratory bronchioles we've got again remember remember how many orders of branching did we get 23 23 orders of branch once inspired air enters the nasal cavity the next area in the upper respiratory tract it comes in contact with is going to be larynx laryngopharynx nasopharynx oropharynx which one these write this as your second question for the in class activity today so as you remember you pass through the nose then the nasal cavity and the first parts that you get in contact with as you get out of the nasal cavity would be the part of the pharynx located behind the nasal cavity which is my nasal pharynx exactly my nasal pharynx is a part that i get in contact with immediately after i exit the nasal cavity so please write your answer here for this question is your number two question of your in-class activity. Respiratory zone. This includes again three main parts. We've got the respiratory bronchioles, we've got the alveolar ducts, and we've got the air sacs, which are clusters of alveoli. As you see on here, each of the air sacs is going to be formed of many smaller air sacs here. Those are called my alveolus. Each one of them is an alveolus. All of them are my alveolus. So again, again, looking here at the part is that allows the gas exchange. What do we call those parts that will allow the gas exchange? We've got the respiratory bronchioles, we've got the alveolar ducts, and we've got the air sacs, which are formed of clusters of alveoli, as you see on here on this diagram. So which one of the three will allow gas exchange to take place? All of them will allow the gas exchange to take place. All of the three will allow the gas exchange. But where most of the gas exchange gonna be taking place, most of the gas exchange actually takes place in my air sacs, in my alveoli. We have around 300 million of them. And those are gonna be representing most of the volume of the lungs. Most of the gas exchange is going to be taking place in my air sacs and the alveoli. And we've got around 300 million alveoli in the lung. You see on here, I've got the blood which has high carbon dioxide levels and low oxygen levels. This is going to be the deoxygenated blood. And this deoxygenated blood gonna reach the capillary beds within my air sacs and other parts of the respiratory zone. This is where I will be performing the gas exchange. I will be releasing the carbon dioxide and I will get oxygen passing through from the air sacs to the capillaries. And then those capillaries will be draining the blood into the 
smaller vessels on here that will be forming larger vessels to deliver the oxygenated blood to my heart. Can you remind me, what do you think is this gonna be? Is this an artery or a vein in here? This is question number three, this is question number four. So number three, what do you think is it? Is this a vein or an arch? Vein or arch, number three, number three, just three. So, Michelle, Martina, and Carla, Tyler, yes, Mia Brown, this is a, an artery. Why is it an artery? Remember, if blood is moving away from the heart, it's an artery. And if blood moves towards the lung, towards the heart, it's a vein. So here, I'm moving the deoxygenated blood, if you remember, from my right ventricle through the pulmonary trunk to reach my lungs. It carries deoxygenated blood. This is one of the most common wrong answers we, we usually see, I usually see in the live exam. So when I mark, this blue vessel, um, a lot of you are programmed to answer it as a vein. Once you see blue, it's a vein. It's not in the lungs. The lungs are getting deoxygenated blood through arteries. Arteries are carrying the blood away from the heart to the lungs. How about the red one, number four? Now I'm getting the blood from the air sacs back to the heart. So I'm going back to the heart. So those are veins or arteries? Veins, exactly. And we call the veins that are draining the lungs. Those are the pulmonary veins that we're getting the blood, if you remember, back from the lungs. To my left atrium that will allow the blood to travel down to the left ventricle and then to get pumped out through the ascending aorta to be distributed as what we've learned back with the vascular system. Any questions? Any questions so far? Any questions? All right. So looking here at the histological structure of the alveoli not sure so i'm gonna be trying something just give me one second here yes. all right so i'm good now all right so all right so i'm not good
All right, so we're looking here at the histological structure of the air sacs. And if you remember, the air sacs, generally speaking, were formed of one row of flat cells, simple squamous epithelium, but here we're adding more information to that. we have actually two types of alveolar cells. We have type one and type two alveolar cells. Type one alveolar cells, those are the ones that are gonna be responsible to allow the gas exchange to take place. So those are the ones through which the oxygen gonna be traveling and the carbon dioxide gonna be traveling to the air sacs. So the type one alveolar cells, those are the ones that will allow the gas exchange to take place. On the other hand, we've got another type of alveolar cells. Those are my type two alveolar cells. And type two alveolar cells or pneumocytes, those are gonna be responsible to produce the surfactant. What is a surfactant? If you remember from the chemistry, the water structure is H2O, if you remember. What was the atomic number of the oxygen? Anybody remembers here? Sixteen, eight, eight. Anybody? Anybody? Atomic number. Atomic number for the oxygen was eight. Sixteen was the atomic mass. So atomic number. What this means? But what do I mean by atomic number? That in the nucleus, I've got protons and I've got neutrons. And being oxygen, what deter what makes me oxygen is the presence of eight protons in my nucleus, regardless of the number of neutrons. All right, but normally I have eight neutrons, which will make my atomic mass 16. So again, again, we've got here the nucleus of the oxygen. It has eight protons. And if you remember, according to the octet rule, the nucleus is gonna be surrounded by energy levels. Each energy level gonna be saturated by having eight electrons, except for, for the very first energy level, it's gonna be saturated having only two electrons. So what's gonna be the distribution here for those electrons? We've got two in the innermost valence shell. And on the outside, we've got the remaining six electrons. So we've got two on the inside, six on the outside. Remember why an atom is gonna be chemically active, willing to create chemical bonds is gonna be to saturate its outermost valence shell. And again, as I have six electrons in my outermost valence shell, this is gonna be in need of two more electrons to become chemically stable. So what will this oxygen do? It will find 
two hydrogens. Each one has a single proton and a single electron. Single proton and a single electron. So if you remember, hydrogen also is not chemically stable. It needs to saturate its outermost valence shell. So what will I do? The oxygen will create a covalent bond with this hydrogen in which you're going to be sharing one pair of electrons for the hydrogen to become chemically stable and for the oxygen also to become chemically stable. Also, it will form another covalent bond, single covalent bond, by sharing one pair of electrons with the other hydrogen. So again, again, how do I build up those, this water molecule? By creating two single covalent bonds between an oxygen and two hydrogens. This gives you H2O. This is the water. Remember, as I have a greater atomic mass, remember oxygen did have eight protons, eight neutrons, which will make the, the atomic mass for the oxygen 16. Compared to the hydrogen, hydrogen only have a single proton without any neutrons, so its atomic mass is going to be only one. So, looking here at the water molecule, you will see oxygen has a very high atomic mass compared to the hydrogen. This causes those electrons to be attracted more towards the oxygen. Although you are sharing those electrons, but those electrons are going to be pulled for most of the time towards the oxygen away from the hydrogen. So what will I do here? I'm creating a water molecule, which is the oxygen, is going to be more negatively charged, and the hydrogens attached to it are going to be more positively charged. Why is the oxygen again is more negatively charged? Why is the hydrogen is going to be more positively charged? Remember, here you've got the electrons pulled for most of the time towards the greater mass. They having a greater atomic mass allows you to create a stronger attractional force. So if we're looking here, why the earth is rotating around the sun? Around the sun here. This is supposed to be the sun here. And not around the moon, for example although the moon is going to be much closer to us. So Earth on here is going to be the moon. So why the Earth is going to be rotating not around the moon, although the moon is going to be much closer to us than the sun. So What do you think? Why the Earth is rotating around the sun, not around the moon, which is very, very close to us compared to the sun? What do you think? Why the Earth is rotating around the moon? Gravitational pull is a stronger, attra greater attractional force, exactly why the sun has a greater attraction force because it has a much greater mass. This is the same concept here within the water. So the electrons are going to be pulled towards the oxygen and the electrons are going to be negatively charged. So the oxygen side of the water molecule, if you're looking here at the water molecule, it has oxygen attached to two hydrogens. 
the oxygen side of the water molecule is going to be more negative and the hydrogen side of the water molecule is going to be more positive. I didn't say that you're going to be losing or gaining an electron. It's still a covalent bond, but here the electrons are pulled more towards the oxygen away from the hydrogen, which will make the hydrogen side of the water molecule going to be more positively charged compared to the oxygen side of the water molecule. So if you're looking at multiple water molecules located on here, so I've got another oxygen attached to two other hydrogens like this, another oxygen attached to two other hydrogens and so on. So oxygen is gonna be more negative, more negative. So what's gonna happen between a side which is more negative and the side which is more positive, I have attraction or repulsion. Attraction, right? I have attraction. So there is an attraction between the hydrogen and the oxygen of another water molecule. This will be called my hydrogen bond. So between the water molecules, we've got attraction force. And this attraction force created is gonna be my hydrogen bond. And this what creates the surface tension. So at the site where you're gonna have water in direct contact with the air, I am creating a surface tension due to this hydrogen bond. So a mosquito, if I'm drawing a mosquito on here, it can't stand on the water without sinking down into the water. Why? Because the bonds here between the water molecule are strong enough to create this surface tension that can hold the weight of the mosquito above it. All right, so why do we say all this? In your air sacs, you've got air and in order for you to allow the gas exchange to take place, you need to have soluble gases. So the gas that you are willing to conduct to your blood, it needs to be soluble. In order for me to allow the gas exchange, this oxygen needs to be soluble. So what is the solvent I will be using? It's gonna be water. And if you see on here, so I've got this thin film of water lining my air sacs. And remember, your lungs are gonna be formed of 300 million alveoli. 300 million, this will make the alveoli very, very tiny. So if I have air in contact with water like this, what's gonna happen? I have a very high surface tension and what do I have between the water particles, attraction or repulsion? What do you think? What do I have between the water molecules, attraction or repulsion? Attraction, so if I'm lining the air sacs with water, so what's, what, what's gonna happen to those alveoli which have a very tiny space, I don't have much space between the walls of my alveolus. So what uh, I'm expecting to have in here, I'm expecting those air sacs to collapse. they will collapse. So why your air sacs do not collapse? 
why your air sacs do not collapse by under the effect of the surface tension of this water film lining your air sacs due to the presence of surfactants. What is a surfactant? A surfactant is simply a detergent like lipoprotein. A detergent is the, has two components, a hydrophilic component and lipophilic component. So this will be covering the surface of the water, reducing the exposure of the water to the air, and this reduces the attractional force that will be created here between the water particles. So for example, if you are willing to wash your dishes and those have lots of fat on them, would you be able to mix the fat with water? What do you think? Am I able to mix the fat with water? No. But what allows me to do so to make the fat more soluble is going to be something that has the ability to bind to both at the same time. I have parts that can bind to the fat, parts that can bind, parts that can bind to the fat, and parts that can bind to the water. This allows the fat to be mixed with the water. This will be the function of the detergent. The same concept on here for my surfactant. So that's why, that's why you need to wash your hands for 20 seconds to get rid of the, any contamination, like the viral contamination of the hands, for example. So why? 20 seconds because this is the time we find that you're going to be able to get rid of, of most of the fat that would be attached to your hands. And the virus, for example, here has a fat part. So in order for me to wash my hands, I need to apply a detergent to attach the water to the fat particle, and in this case, the fat particles are your virus that you want to get rid of. All right, so again, again, normally, normally you can't mix the fat with water. You can't wash your hands with just water and get rid of any bacteria or any virus contaminating your hands. All right, you need something that will be allowing the mixture of the fat to the water, which is going to be the detergent that we're looking at in here. It's going to be my surfactant, which is going to be produced by what type of alveolar cells? My type 2 pneumocytes or type 2 alveolar cells. Is this clear here? So normally my lungs do not collapse simply because I am capable to produce a surfactant. And again, wet cells of the lungs are gonna be allowing the release of the surfactant. Those are my type two alveolar cells or type two pneumocytes. All right. What if I don't have surfactant? So a baby was born prematurely. So I, don't, I do have premature lung cells. I didn't activate my type two alveolar cells. So this baby, this premature baby gonna have water in his air sacs 
and this water fill is gonna cause very strong attraction force, it's very strong surface tension, causing the alveoli to collapse. So the baby is gonna have difficulty breathing. <laughs> He's exerting more effort to pull the air against those collapsing air sacs. All right, we call this as my neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. All right, so what causes a neonatal respiratory distress syndrome is gonna be immature type two alveolar cells and having immature alveolar cells, type two alveolar cells, this means you are not gonna be producing the surfactant needed for you to inhibit the lungs from collapsing. All right, so I don't have surfactant. And as a result, I will be facing a major problem with this, with this premature baby because his lungs are collapsing. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna be giving him corticosteroids to enhance the maturation of his lungs. Also, we're gonna keep him on a positive pressure ventilator. But something to pay attention to is that you, can, you have to avoid putting this, ba this baby on a positive pressure ventilator for a long time because this is going to cause harm to the air sacs. Yes. Martina, yes, the surfactant is going to be produced during the later months, month of pregnancy. Yes. So born prematurely, I have premature lung cells, type 2 alveolar cells. And so I have lacking surfactants causing this baby's lungs to collapse. All right, so again, again, what are the two cells that you can see on here? We've got the type 1 pneumocytes type one alveolar cells. Those are the alveolar cells responsible to allow the gas exchange to take place. And we've got the type two alveolar cells. Those are the surfactant secreting cells. And we've got the macrophages scattered around. And remember macrophages are not originally from the lungs. Those are coming from outside of the lung they were my monocytes, which will be migrating and live now in my lung tissue. And remember, those monocytes, those that will become macrophages, will be getting different names according to the organ where they are located now. And we're gonna call the ones located in the lungs. Those are my dust cells. Those are the ones responsible to ingest and phagocytose any dust particles. This is why we give them the name dust cells. Looking here at a transverse section of the thoracic cavity with the lungs inside, what we can see on here, we can see that the trachea splits into right and left main bronchi. 
right and left main bronchi. And this, those bronchi are gonna be passing to the lungs through the hilum. The hilum also serves as a site of for the pa passage of the pulmonary arteries. And remember the pulmonary arteries are the ones which are in blue and the exit of the pulmonary veins, those are the ones in red. So this is the hilum of the lung. And remember, we've got main bronchus, pulmonary vein and artery traveling through the hilum of the lung. The heart, if you see, if you remember, is going to be located between the right and left lungs. It's going to be more directed towards the left side. That's why the left lung is going to be smaller in size compared to the right lung, because the heart is going to be pointing down to the left. Something else to notice on here is that each of the lungs is going to be surrounded by a membrane, and this membrane has two layers, a layer lining the cavity and a layer covering the lungs from outside. Have two layers. We call this membrane is my pleura. Like any serous membrane, I have two layers, one that is lining the cavity, one is covering the surface of my organ. So we call the one lining the cavity, this is my parietal layer, and we call the one that is going to be covering the surface of the organ, this is my visceral layer. So again, again, We've got the pleura on here surrounding the lungs. It has two layers. It has an outside layer. This is my parietal pleura and a visceral layer. This is going to be covering the lung itself. In between, if you notice on here, I have a cavity between the two layers of the pleura. We call this as my pleural cavity. So again, again, an outside layer of the pleura, it's my parietal. Inside layers that covers the lung, it's my visceral layer. And in between the two layers, we've got the pleural cavity. Same for the heart. If you remember, we've studied a membrane that was surrounding the heart. This was my pericardium. And the pericardium, as you remember, it also did have two layers the parietal layer and the visceral layer, we call this parietal and visceral pericardium. All right, any questions on here? Any questions? This diagram, it's a four stars diagram for the upcoming lab exam. This is a four stars diagram for the upcoming lab exam. We can hear at one of the most complicated topics in this chapter, which is gonna be the mechanics of breathing. So let's have a break before we get into this topic. So we can have a break for 10 and we come back, start our discussion of the mechanics of breathing. But before we go to the break, so Joseph here has a question. So this, diagram we only need to know the highlighted terms so thoracic wall pulmonary trunk heart root no all of them gonna be uh, easy to identify so all you are expected to know all the terms on here 
all the terms are going to be easy to identify. Pulmonary trunk, definitely. Uh, thoracic wall, left lung, right lung, left pulmonary vein, pulmonary artery, bronchus, the hilum, uh, behind the tra behind the bifurcation here of the trachea, it's going to be the esophagus. So all of the terms on here are going to be highly important. Either we discuss them today or we have we discussed them previously in a different chapter. All right, so all of the terms on the diagram are going to be testable. The most important ones are the ones that we've discussed, but all of them are going to be testable. So let's have a 